Hello everyone, welcome to an episode of Christian's Ramblings. And in today's episode, we're gonna take a look at my jazz guitar levels table. So you can calculate what your current level is and what you need to do to gain one or more levels. So this is my rambling series. It's a video series in which I'm rambling all the time without a script, just talk, 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 talk. If you don't wanna hear me talk, don't watch this video. If you're still watching the video, even if you don't wanna hear me talk, you can uh, put in the comments that you think that I talk too much in any language you want. So let's get to the subject of today. The first version of this table was made in 2016. The first year I was teaching guitar at Django and June because uh, I wanted to give the students some insight in the amount of hours it would take to gain proficiency in jazz guitar in certain aspects. And since then, I've been updating this table to reflect new insights, new experiences. And as it is today, I think it's a good reflection of what my current thoughts are on this subject. So let's take a look at the chart. So the chart has seven categories or seven levels, and each level has four parameters. So it goes from beginner all the way to legend. Beginner, level one, amateur, level two. Then we have competent jammer, expert jammer, pro, professional, master, and legend. And I chose these titles for specific reasons, especially the competent jammer and expert jammer, and I will uh, talk about that. And I chose the parameters also for good reasons. And as you can see, there is no comping or rhythm playing in this chart. So I left that out of the equation completely. And I do realize that it is an important part, but my focus in this channel is also more on soloing. And when I teach workshops, it's usually also about soloing. And I realize there are legendary rhythm players that are not good at soloing. And I also realized that there are master um, solo players that are not maybe uh, legendary rhythm players. Although uh, usually when people are very good solo players, they also are good rhythm players. Uh, and the other way around, that's completely not necessary. But as I said, comping is not a part of this chart. I'm only looking at soloing in this table. So let's start with beginner level. Now beginner level is when you just bought a guitar or, or you loan a guitar and you have no experience and you're just starting your journey. So the amount of hours that you spend on playing guitar is zero, like it says in the table, and it goes all the way to practicing for 500 hours. So the hours is about practicing. So from zero to 500 hours, you are a beginner. And now you might think, wow, that's actually a lot of hours. And it is. But if you do some calculations, I am calculating that you can practice at most 340 days a year. So not 365 because nobody can practice all days of the year. There's always something that might happen. You are on holiday. You don't feel like practicing. You're sick. I even think that 340 is too much probably, but I'm going to take that average. Now, if you would practice one and a half hour a day for your first year, which is quite a lot for a beginner, it's, it's hard to practice one and a half hours a day from the beginning. So I think maybe in the beginning you maybe are practicing 40 minutes and then maybe near the end of that year, if you are serious, you might be practicing two hours. So I'm going to take one and a half hours as an average and I have a calculator here because I learned the hard way that you should never do calculations when on camera. If you would practice 340 uh, days for one and a half hour, you would be practicing 510 hours. So that is from beginning to amateur actually. So what would you be doing that first year? You'll be working on your technique, you would be working on your 
um, well, technique mostly, you would be learning some tunes and uh, you would be working maybe a little bit on probably on rhythm, not so much on soloing. So that's why the parameters are like this, right? So tunes, 20. And with that, I mean, you maybe familiarize yourself with 20 tunes. Doesn't mean that you'll be able to play those 20 tunes by heart. You might need some charts for some tunes, but when you're at a jam, probably only to play rhythm, and somebody calls one of these 20 tunes, you know you could play it. Maybe you, you might need a chart, but you could play some chords. Now, the prep means how, many, how much preparation you might need to function in a gig. Now, as gigging as a beginner is probably not going to happen, but let's say to function in a jam session. Maybe someone invites you for a jam session and you'd ask, okay, what tunes are we going to play? And uh, they'd give maybe five tunes you've never heard of. The preparation time for you to learn those tunes cannot be really estimated. That's why I say until ready. It's just going to take you as long as it's going to take you. Depends on the tune. Depends on if there are any other tunes you know that are similar. It depends on how much you practice. So I would say until ready, which could be anything from a week to, I don't know, a month to learn one tune. And solos, it says none. Probably you're not soloing. And if you are soloing, it is only at home, very slowly, maybe with a, on a very simple tune like, like minor swing. So the, for those first 500 hours, you are working on getting a basic technique, uh, getting an understanding of the music, familiarizing yourself with the forms of uh, tunes, right? Like, oh, there's a, two A's and a bridge and A. You'll be listening to a lot of better players. You Maybe you're taking lessons or you're watching lots of tutorials on YouTube. Now, once you hit that 500 hours mark, and that could be after one year, but probably most players would be a beginner for two years because they're not going to make the 500 hours in one year. It might take them one and a half year or two years. Then you are an amateur. Some things don't change. As you can see, the preparation time, it still says until ready. What if I would call an amateur for a jam session or even for a gig, I couldn't expect them to learn new tunes in any amount of time I want them to learn it. It's going to take them the amount of time it's going to take them. I can't uh, count on a certain amount of time for them to learn a tune. They'll probably familiarize themselves with about 40 tunes. Again, uh, not all by heart. Probably uh, some of them still need charts, but at least they can play them if... Um, Asked. There are some things written in solos, and I couldn't write everything there that I wanted to write, so it needs explanation, but I wrote some key points there. So it says, uh, solos on a few tunes, right? So there are some tunes they probably can play a simple solo on, tunes like Minor Swing, maybe they can play a simple solo on All of Me, maybe they can play a simple solo on a Rhythm Changes like, like Daphne. It's not going to be great solos, it's going to be easy solos with some problems, right? So one of the problems is, it says, inco incoherence. One problem will be that the solos will consist of lots of short little fragments that are not really connecting. There's no fluency, there's no flow, right? It's impossible to reach in 500 hours. It even says 500 to 2,000 hours. I think for 2,000 hours, this problem will stay there, that you are uh, prone to play incoherent solos. There's no flow. There's always this possibility of you completely messing up there will be severe timing issues in that um, period of time mostly rushing or a very uneven swing eighth notes right so if you play swing eighth notes we play a simple lick like this for a minor one two three four maybe it will sound like this when you're rushing Right, so there's this part of the lick that is rushing, or there's a combination with playing uneven swing notes, where some notes are very swinging, some notes are straight, and other notes are have a different kind of swing feel, maybe something like this, three, four. Right, so it's very uneven. There, I made a mistake with the, the notes even. And there will be severe technical issues, which you can hear by notes that are missed or sloppy playing in general. You will have that level probably from 500 to 2000 hours of practicing. Now, when I talk about practice hours, I actually talk about well-spent practice hours. And that is a big problem because in the beginning, you might not even 
know what to practice or how to practice. So a lot of your practice will be kind of wasted. Of course, it's never wasted to spend time with your instrument, but you might be practicing things that you shouldn't be practicing or you are not practicing the things that you should be practicing enough or you are distracted and just repeating things that you can already do, right? So uh, you have 2,000 hours of optimal practice, but probably it's going to be more like 3,000 hours because 1,000 of those hours might be not very efficient. Now, let's say you reach the 2,000 hour mark. So how long would that take you? Let's say by this time you're practicing two hours a day. We're going to take an average of two hours a day from the beginning. If you are want to reach 2,000 hours divided by three hours a day, it's going to take you 666 days divided by 340. So it's going to take you about two years to reach this competent jammer. But uh, in reality, probably more like three years, right? Because you're spending all this time uh, not practicing the right stuff. Or maybe one year you cannot make the 340 days, which seems very reasonable. So I'm going to say two and a half to three years to reach competent jammer. And I'm calling this level competent jammer because at this point in time, you're probably not doing regular gigs or getting S for gigs. You're mostly going to jam sessions. And at, at this point, the 2000 hours, you actually start to enjoy jamming, right? You're not getting nervous for jams anymore. Maybe you are even organizing jams. You're traveling to festivals to jam to get this experience. And from this point in time, it also starts being really important to jam because jamming is actually not represented in these hours, but it's very important for you to start playing with other people. I'd say if you want to reach the levels beyond this, then 10% of your practice hours or on top of the practice hours should be spent jamming. So let's say you want to reach the 5,000 hour mark, then probably you should have been jamming also for an additional 500 hours, right? So it's going to be 5,500. It's not meant to be a precise number. It's just an average, an estimate based on my progression and also based on the progression I've seen in other people. The first five to six years of my practicing, I actually kept tabs of my uh, hours and I stopped doing that last two years. But uh, until then, I could see my progression being very similar to what is written in this chart. So for those 2,000 to 5,000 hours, you might learn 100 tunes. And at this point, I'm, I'm thinking probably around half to three quarters of it, you actually start knowing by heart. Also, you start learning the themes. You could actually play the themes of these tunes, which is very hard if you're an amateur. Maybe you can even make 100 tunes by heart, but at least 50 to, to 70. Your preparation time is starting to become much faster. And I'm thinking that you could learn a new repertoire the same week. Maybe you might not be able to play all the themes, but you could at least learn all the tunes by heart when it comes to the chords. And you probably be ready to play it at a jam or even a small gig. I would give you the tunes at the beginning of the week on Monday. You'll be able to play them on Friday if you were practicing those two hours a day. Now, when you're soloing, you can probably solo on most tunes, right? There's some exceptions, maybe really fast tunes you would maybe decline to play a solo or maybe very complicated tunes with lots of chords or weird keys. You might maybe not want to do that, but there is still some problems. One of the problems is frequent holes. That means that there will be parts of many tunes that you actually are not able to play something fluent or something coherent, right? So that will mess with the coherency of your solo because maybe you are playing, let's say you're playing Belleville and the A parts are great. You can play very coherently, but then in the B part where it goes to G flat, you start making mistakes and that kind of messes up, of course, the flow of the solo. So that, that's what I mean with frequent holes. There's still lots of places in the tunes where you are not fluent. You will still have timing issues, most likely. They will, it will be much better than the amateur, but you're still frequently rushing a little bit or your string timing is, is not consistent. Because again, I said it many times, but timing and technique are the biggest problems. And it also says tec technique issues. You will still have certain tempos or certain tunes or certain licks where you will sound sloppy. Mostly related to the fact that you haven't synchronized your right and left hand yet. That is the most difficult thing about technique is the synchronization between both hands. You can have a very fast left hand or a very fast right hand, although that is harder. 
but if it's not synchronized, it will sound sloppy. So you, you'll hear lots of competent jammers that are really fun to jam with because they know lots of tunes and they're pretty quick with learning new ones, but when they're soloing, it sounds sloppy. So it's advisable in that situation to do play lots of solos, but not make them too long, especially when you're in a jam with really good players. Because this is also the time that you actually might find yourself in a jam with, with pros or even sometimes masters. So it's good jam etiquette then to not hog the limelight. Let's say you play half the courses of the pro player. Now until 5,000 hours, you will stay this competent jammer, but then you will surely but slowly become an expert jammer. Let's do a quick calculation. Let's say at this time you're practicing three to four hours a day. So let's take an average of three hours a day. You did the first two years to reach competent jammer and you're 2000 hours. You need to practice 3000 hours divided by three. That's a thousand hours, of course. Yeah, that wasn't necessary for me to calculate. Divided by 340 is gonna be another three years. So at this point, you've been practicing for five years. And again, there will be a lot of uh, wasted hours. So probably it's gonna be more like six years until you reach the expert jammer level. And mind you, I'm talking about somebody who's really serious about playing, right? Somebody that's practicing every day on things they need to learn and they, they get frustrated, but they soldier on because lots of people give up before they reach this point, just out of sheer frustration. So now you've reached the 5,000 hour mark and you're an expert jammer. And this means the people start recognizing you in the jam scene, right? They, they know you to be a great jammer. They want you at their jams, uh, other expert jammers or even pros, right? They know you know all the tunes and they know you can hold your own when soloing. So at this point, uh, 150 tunes is not rare. You probably know these tunes by heart. And even if you don't know them by heart, you probably pick them up within one chorus during a jam. You can play themes to most tunes. You can handle most tempos. And if I would give you a repertoire to learn, you could probably learn it that same day, right? Uh, I, I give you a call at uh, noon. I say, listen, can you fit in the gig tonight at uh, eight? But we have this set list and there's, I don't know, like six tunes you don't know. You probably can learn them that same day. You can even play solos uh, that same day. So you'll be soloing on all tunes. There will not be significant holes. Even if the song gets difficult, you'll know how to handle it and can keep the fluency. Might not be uh, the best solos ever, but the solos will all be fine. You will still have occasional timing issues because like I said, timing is the most difficult thing. So you'll still rush sometimes, but the big difference is that you actually are aware of it, right? You do this and you feel bad about it because you are listening to yourself, you're listening to how you sound in relationship to the, to the rhythm section. Your technique issues will most likely be solved. Uh, except for the fastest of tunes, you'll probably be able to handle it. Your playing will not be sloppy. It will be very clear. The biggest issue you, you have right now is variety issues. So it means that you will sound pretty much the same on every tune because you didn't spend enough time yet on trying to get good at chord soloing or octaves or creating space. Now, there are many people that are expert jammers. If you go to a festival like the festival in Fontainebleau, the used to be in Samoa, and you go to the campsite, there will be many expert jammers and they will sound great. They have a super high level. Everybody likes to jam with you and you know all the tunes. But if you would be recording yourself or if you would be listening to an expert jammer for five songs, it'd still be great but you start hearing the variety issues. They will pretty much sound the same all the time. They, they'll sound good, but they'll sound the same. It's a huge accomplishment to reach this expert jammer level. So don't let the variety issues discourage you from trying to reach it. You need to reach this expert jammer level before you can start developing yourself as a unique personality. And that will reach once you hit the 7,000 hour mark. And something interesting uh, is starting now. As you can see, the tunes from Pro to Legend, I didn't put any high numbers because knowing 200 tunes is probably more than enough to handle most situations. So it's not a necessity for you to learn tunes very obsessively. Like I think it's a necessity to do that when you are a beginner, amateur or competent jammer. Because now you'll be so fast at learning a new tune that it says same day, but I could also written um, 
the same hour or the same half hour. Right? You'll get a new tune and you'll learn it almost instantly. So the preparation, I kept it that same day. I kept tunes at the same number because this is not your focus. Your focus is now on improving as a soloist. So that's where it gets interesting. All tunes, no holes, that's the same. But this is where you start hearing someone's personality, someone's style, because they've been thinking about that for the last 2,000 hours, from 5,000 to 7,000. So now we're probably around practicing four to six hours a day. So uh, we were at five years, right? So from five years, you start practicing four to six hours a day. You need another 2,000 hours divided by, let's, let's do an average of four. So that's 500, of course. Um, divided by 340 days. So that's one and a half year. So one and a half year, you can go from expert jammer to professional if you would be putting in the hours, but this is the problem. Lots of people don't have the time anymore to practice because now you'll, you'll actually be jamming. Maybe if you're group, maybe you're recording an album. How are you gonna put in the practice hours? That's why there are not so many people in the pro level as there are in the expert jammers level because of all the gigging and all the recording, which is very important. Like I said, you still need to do 10% on top of the practice hours. You, you still need to be doing that. Because of that, you don't have time to practice. But if you would be doing that, you could reach the pro level at 7,000 hours, right? So let's go to the issues because the issues are occasional concert issues. And this is what's been happening to me a lot like uh, the past, not last year, but before that, when I, was, when I was this pro, right? I got hired for gigs and then I'd be playing great, but some concerts I'd get nervous or I'd feel unsafe because the monitor sound wasn't good or the rhythm player was very loud. It starts messing with your confidence and that starts messing with your technique and timing. And the problem is you'll be aware of it and you'll feel really bad. And this happens to a lot of professionals still. Not always and less and less the more you start working on it, but it's still an issue. So you won't have this during like small gigs or jams. You'll be on top of your game. But during big concerts, it can still mess with you. The weird thing is I had this while I was also a violin player that didn't have this problem. So with violin, I outgrew this already, but I still had it on guitar. So it's not like you can use the experience you have on another instrument and then just transfer it to guitar. Because even though the violin, it's very difficult to make me nervous or lose my confidence. Even if the sound is bad, I'll still be playing at, at a appropriate level. But with guitar, for a long time, it was not like that from seven to 10,000 hours, as you can see in this chart. So once you reach the 10,000 hour mark of dedicated practice, I'd say you're a master. And tunes, I mean, it says 200, but who knows how many tunes you know. Preparation, same day, but I could have written same minute. Not maybe when you have to play a very complicated tune, but like most tunes, you can learn instantly. And then the solos, the big difference with the pro, as you can see, is that it's always good, right? You're always on top of your game. My, I mean, you might have concerts that you're brilliant. You might have concerts that it's just good, but you won't go below a certain level. Right now, I'm at that level, right? So since maybe one and a half year, I know that I will always play good. Not brilliant, but good, right? I'm calling that master level. It's when you can be hired for gigs and the people that hire you can be confident that you'll do a good job. Again, maybe not brilliant, but you do a good job. You will sound like you, right? You will sound like you are a unique guitar player and your timing will be solid, your technique will be solid. And the funny thing is, if you would look at this chart, let's say you've reached 10,000 hours of practice, right? You can just estimate it. You don't have to know that exactly. It's probably after like nine to 10 years of practicing and you, you know all the tunes and you're very good at preparation, but you notice that you're not always good. You can look at the other parts of the chart to see what the issue is, right? So let's say you still have occasional concert issues. It means that you probably didn't get enough experience playing concerts because that's how you solve it, right? You practice hard, but you also do concerts. So maybe you're not doing enough gigs. Maybe you're not you have your own group or you're not recording. So that might be the issue. So you need to work on that and solve that specifically, right? You could uh, start a band or 
you could, you could start a band or you could record an album. Or let's say you have another problem. When you listen to yourself, you still have occasional timing issues, which, which shouldn't be the case, right? That's still the level of expert jammer. That probably means you were not working on your timing enough. So you didn't spend the practice hours as efficiently as you should have. So you need to go back and work on that very hard until you solve that. Now, once you reach the master level, it becomes really fun to practice almost because now you're not working on on basic things like technique or timing, you're actually working on your vocabulary, researching new sounds, new concepts, uh, meeting lots of other uh, master musicians or expert jammers. I mean, for you, it's now it's it's fun to, to jam with pros and expert jammers, doesn't really matter. Uh, you'll be invited for concerts, to play at festivals, to teach workshops. The funny thing is I was already teaching workshops when I was still an expert jammer, right? But that's because I had a very clear vision of how to learn things. So that was interesting for people to follow the workshop. But my level was not at the level yet that I think I could demonstrate everything that I wanted to demonstrate. Right now, I can demonstrate anything I want to demonstrate and I know it will work. Now we get to the last category, which is a legend. Now, as you can see, I doubled the amount of hours because to become a legend is very, very difficult. It's only for a few of the guitar players that you see out there. And 20,000 plus hours, who knows? It's a lot of concerts, it's a lot of playing. Maybe you're not even practicing the six hours a day, but you're just playing all the time. You're recording, you're playing with other celebrities, you do big concerts, you play on television, you record albums as a sideman for other people, you do a lot of that stuff. So uh, it's not merely like the practicing the six hours a day, it's also just being a professional in the field. Your preparation time, I said not needed because, well, if you would invite somebody like Stochalo or Borelli, which are the legends I'm talking about, or Anto de Bar or Adrien Monjar, Gonzalo Berga, Bergara, people like that, they, they, know, they don't need your preparation, right? You can, they can come to the concert hall and play with you no matter what. Of course, there might be some tunes they don't like to play or that they're not as comfortable with, but you know, they'll still manage to play something nice on that tune during the concert. I'm talking about high pressure playing here. But let's see what the difference is with a master, right? So expert timing, right? Their timing is always on point. It always swings if it needs to swing. They can play with their timing to suit the atmosphere. When you listen to it, you feel good. That's because their timing is always on point. They are instantly recognizable, right? When uh, Stochel plays, you, you recognize him because of the sound that he has. That's also a big part of being a legend. It's, it's the sound. I didn't write it here, but it's very important. But it's part of the instantly recognizable uh, factor, right? The sound is very recognizable. The, their vocabulary is very recognizable. They use a certain vocabulary that's really part of their style. And th think about those people. Think about Birelli. Think about uh, Stochelo, Adam Monjar, Angelo de Bar, Sebastian Ginio, Gonzalo. People like that, you, you recognize them instantly. Also, another important thing is their solos are always special. Every solo they play, you, you want to transcribe because you want to actually study what they're doing. And until now, I've been only uh, mentioning uh, gypsy jazz guitar players. I should have mentioned guitar players from the uh, more modern realm as well. So uh, here I'm talking about legends like Kurt Rosewinkel, uh, Mike Moreno, Pasquale Grasso, or even players that are not alive anymore like Wes Montgomery, Joe Pass, pe people like that. Now, of course, in the in the legend category, there's also different uh, levels of legendary because there's people that invent a new style of playing, right? They, they might be even more legendary, but I don't want to make the difference right here. It's just a certain level of playing that you recognize instantly. And the same goes for the master level. Uh, there's also different levels of master, but there are all people that you want to hire to play in your band. So that's it for this video. Uh, so the, the, the task for yourself is, would be to see where you are in this table and what it is that you need to work on. I would also like to hear to, if you don't agree with this table in some aspects or in all aspects, and we can have a nice discussion. Uh, I'd be very curious to hear that. So this is the end of the rambling episode. I will see you all in the next video. Bye.